All right. So hi, uh, my name is Craig Hood. I'm a professor of biology and also a faculty member in the environment program here at Loyola University. We welcome everybody here and also we have a YouTube stream as well. And uh, you know, this may be, I think, this is the first serious, full, in the flesh, in person event in Nunamaker Hall uh, in two years. So we, we had a, we've had a few other events here at Loyola. And we'll have more in the spring. So, you know, just keep going. I just took my mask off here. And all of the, the folks that are comfortable in doing so on the panel can do so. While you are sitting, you can take your mask off if you have distance or and know the person next to you and you're comfortable with that. And so we thank you too for uh, handling masks and vaccinations and whatnot uh, as we make our way through the pandemic. This event, I'm just going to do a short intro. This event is sponsored by the Environment Program here at Loyola, the Department of Biological Sciences and the Louisiana Master Naturalists uh, chapter here in uh, New Orleans. And all of these entities are committed to formal and informal environmental education. And here at Loyola, we have a number of formal and informal environmental science education uh, elements, you know, including secondary ed certification and so on. I encourage anyone that's interested, or you can talk to folks, you know, that might be to be certified in secondary education. And here's the deal. I think that teachers are every bit as important of first responders as any healthcare person. And they have been under <laughs> siege and are needed now more than ever. And with regards to the environment, yep, especially here in New Orleans, we understand the, all of these things. I'm going to pitch this over to Janelle Simpson, who can say a word or two about Louisiana Master Naturalists, who's one of our sponsors, so that you understand what their involvement is and what they do. Good evening. I'm Janelle Simpson. I'm the president of the local chapter of the Louisiana Master Naturalist. We're a community of citizens who engage with the environment through education and natural history. Um, we're excited to be here tonight with uh, this panel of great, um, to hear a great discussion. And I just wanted to say something about our chapter. We offer workshops twice each year, in the fall and in the spring. And if you're interested in signing up for one of our workshops, you can find more information at our website. For our members that are here, welcome. This is the first time we've seen some of you in person, not in a square on Zoom in quite a while. So it's good to see you. I have just a few basic announcements for our members. First of all, anyone who was certified in the past 18 months does not have your badge. You can get it outside at a table from Carol Rice after the presentation. Barbara Craner, who runs the Nature Store, should also be here to offer um, Master Naturalist swag if you're interested in purchasing that. Um, there's a volunteer opportunity that just came up that we would like to make you aware of tomorrow. Soul, which is our partner of the year organization, has a need. If you're available tomorrow morning and want to help out with that, please see Mary Gubala, raise your hand. She'll also be outside after the presentation at the table in the lobby there. Um, and then finally, don't forget to file your continuing ed uh, two hours for this presentation on Track It Forward. Glad to see everybody. So, so with no further ado, I'm going to pass this over to Dr. M.A. Thomas, who's director of the Environment Program, to introduce the program, give you uh, just a couple of minutes of uh, context for where we, we go. And then 
most of the folks that are moderating this are our students. And so uh, appreciate their effort. Great, thank you, Dr. Hood. Hi, everyone, welcome. It's so nice to see your faces, ah, without a mask. Um, so it, it's, if we say that 100 times, it's because we're super excited about that. Um, I wanna give just a little context to why um, we put this panel together tonight and, um, and, and introduce a couple of folks that have helped us to get where we are with our understanding of water management. And that's why we wanted to have this event tonight so that others can learn what we've been learning the last couple of years with our research. And so just a little bit of background. Um, first of all, I think probably this audience knows New Orleans is a coastal city, right? So here's a photo that shows New Orleans and it shows where we are with proximity to uh, the Gulf of Mexico, focused mostly on the Mississippi River Delta. Great photo um, that shows a sense of place. I always like to start with a sense of place so you kind of know where we are and where we fit in in this region. Um, being a coastal city is particularly important right now. Um, if you're following the news, if you're reading about the science that we're learning, um, we're vulnerable. We're vulnerable to flooding. We are vulnerable to um, in increasing threats of hurricanes, as we all experienced with Hurricane Ida recently, Zeta, um, Laura, all the other ones that are, that are hitting our coast um, with increasing severity, sea level rise, um, unintended consequences of those effects like subsidence. And so these are all factors that we need to be aware of, we need to know about, and they all increase our chances of flooding and severity, severity of flooding. On average, our city gets 64 inches of rain a year. I don't know if you ever knew that and, and what that actually means. Just get, you know, hold out 64 inches and, and try to imagine that. When did we reach that number this year in New Orleans? In May, in May. And on average, we get 64 inches of rain. Um, when we first started studying this, we didn't know that that was gonna happen, but now we're thinking, oh my gosh, in five months, 64 inches of rain. With flooding issues, they've been solved historically by pumping excess water um, out of our streets into a canal system. This started when our city was created over 300 years ago, even before we had um, human enforced levee systems. And you can see this picture that comes out of Campanella's book of uh, the city in 1885. And so if you look to Baca Town, I can't say that well, but y'all can probably say it better than I do. Baca Town, Treme area, the back of our town, where the Superdome is now, where um, Highway 90 is at Treme, Seventh Ward, that area was a swamp, as was the re most of the city, um, all the way through Metairie and, and into the Kenner area, all the way to the lake. So this is, um, we've had this issue for over 300 years, and we still choose to live here. More on that. Um, so we've solved these pumping, or these, these issues with pumping the excess water that we get every year um, out of, of the, the streets. We pump it into, um, into different canals that are, um, that run throughout our city. Um, we call this gray infrastructure. So that's one of the things you're gonna hear tonight about gray infrastructure. That's an issue. It consists of our aging pipes. And if you, you all drove here tonight, or even if you walked here, you know that we have aging infrastructure, gray infrastructure. We have aging canals. We have a pumping station that still logs everything by hand. That is true. Um, we have one pumping station that drains all of Uptown New Orleans. That is true. It goes to that canal right at Palmetto that goes in front of Xavier, goes all the way to the Jefferson Line, takes a 90 degree angle turn out to Lake Pontchartrain. That's what drains all of Uptown New Orleans, okay? Keep that in mind. Um, that causes stress on the system time and time and time again. Every time that we have a rain event, which is why we have floods you know, in, in different times throughout the year, not just during you know, one season. Unfortunately, what we've been doing has proven problematic. Um, in, and we receive all this water in a short period of time, pumping all that storm water out, it's no longer a viable solution. We know that. If you don't know that, know that now. And let's not punt and make it somebody else's fault. Let's figure out a solution. I'm, I'm solution driven. An unintended consequence to all of this, of course, is you just have to look outside. This is a picture that our panelist Sam took um, for her research um, in 2018 on our campus. And um, it, 
I think Skylar said, um, that's today, that's not 2018. And in fact, it is today, it's every day that we get a lot of rain. It looks like this outside. So um, we have to remove all that. Well, what are the other unintended consequences? All you have to do is walk around and, and pay attention and notice things like the picture at the top left where the street, this is over in the Fountain Blow Broadmoor area where I live, um, where it's sinking. We know the word is subsidence, where the, the, the sinkage is occurring. Um, you know, it ends up, we, over time, we have um, sidewalks that look like this at the bottom left. The picture on the, the bottom right is very close to the one at the top left, where the whole side is sinking down. And it's kind of hard to see, but if you look closely, there's a drain there that is completely covered with live oak leaves. So that's an issue. Um, the picture at the top right is, um, is a house that you can see where the original foundation was. So you can see the sinkage of about a foot or up to two feet in some areas. This is a problem. So we know that this is a problem. Um, it's been a problem. And so we need to find solutions. The people that we've invited here tonight are some of the solution makers. And they're the ones that protect us in different capacities. So I'm not going to steal their thunder. They're going to tell you about that. But let me just tell you a little bit about how we came to put this together other than we had this issue. So let, let's find a solution. So we designed a program a couple of years ago um, that we were going to focus on the Mirabu Water Project and talk about um, solutions to this flooding. Well, Mirabu Water Project, if you haven't heard of it, please Google it, learn about it. It's part of the Gentilly Resilience District where they, um, the city has about $141 million to do projects that help with flooding issues. Um, and so it's, it's a slow go, as things are. And so instead of waiting around for these things to be built, we thought, let's go ahead and start doing something about this. So we designed the science and design, what we're calling Loyola Academy. We have some handouts up there. Y'all stand up and show them your shirts. There you go. So that's one of our shirts from our workshop this summer. And we have some extras. So please take one if you would like it. And hats, if there are any left. Um, this workshop that we put together. It's a design and science um, workshop that incorporates interdisciplinary aspects or approaches, techniques, in the hopes of understanding the social, the cultural, the ecological implications of how New Orleans citizens manage their water. And so we've invited participants from uh, the greater New Orleans region, including high school teachers, um, high school students. We have um, people from, uh, who work in sustainability, with people from nonprofits, citizens that are just interested in learning about these things come to our summer workshop to learn these things. And so we talk about the formation of Southeast Louisiana. We talk about the founding of New Orleans. We talk about gray infrastructure, the green infrastructure that's the ah part of the night, like that's the solution-driven part that we're going to focus on and creating best tools for educating our community. We want to make sure that others know. That's what we do in academia, as you know. We try to study issues and then tell people about them so they can learn and hopefully embrace the water in our city. We love this city. It's why we live here. We choose to live here because it's a great place. So we got to come up with some solutions. Quickly, the purpose of our research is too dense to go into in, in a lot of detail, but just to give you a little basis of it, um, we want to bring communities together and we want to develop creatable, sustainable ways of dealing with excess water around the city, learning from other people, implementing projects ourselves. We're also studying changes, um, if any, that people will make after learning about the significance of water and hopefully empowering them to take control of their environment. So that's kind of the focus of our research right now. Um, the speakers we've invited, I said, are great. We worked with them. We, we have met many of them um, through our Loyola Academy, and uh, they're doing incredible things in our city. And so I want to turn it over and y'all meet the, the panelists tonight. We have some set questions that we are going to pose to them, uh, but we will certainly have um, an opportunity for Q&A at the end. So if you have a question for a panelist, jot it down on a piece of paper, in your phone, whatever, uh, we will have an opportunity for Q&A at the end. Okay? All right. Welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm Verlene Einstein, a senior environmental, science, uh, environmental studies student. And over the past years, I have been conducting research with Dr. Thomas on water and finding more sustainable ways to live with it. So my interest for water comes from my background. I grew up in 
um, three cities. So I was born in Haiti, and there the issue with water is the lack of um, clean and potable water, and many residents don't have access to um, clean water in their homes. And then I grew up in Los Angeles, where our issue is a severe drought. So we're getting our water from the Colorado River and an aquifer, but the aquifer is quickly drying up. <laughs> and so um, residents have been asked to um, reduce their water usage through um, using more sustainable gardening techniques and just overall limiting their water usage. And then three years ago, I moved to New Orleans for university and here the water, the issue is too much water and then we're trying to pump it all out, but we received too much water. So now we have to find a way to deal with it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Anna Kay Sitzman. I'm also a senior environmental studies social science student. Um, water plays a very important role in my life. I am a swimmer here at Loyola and I'm a certified weather nerd. Um, Loyola's environment program welcomed me with open arms, um, gave me a great opportunity to grow, learn, apply my passions and knowledge, and gave me my dream, allowed me to get my dream job at uh, 21 years old. I spent the summer working for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So to already have my dream job, I'm very thankful for Loyola and everything that the environment program has given me, and I'm happy to represent this program today. And with that, we are going to introduce our panelists who are the experts and here to inspire us more, help us learn more. Um, first, we have Will Veach, who is a hydrologist with 13 years experience, all with the New Orleans District of the US Army Corps of Engineers. He currently serves in the Lower Mississippi River and Tributaries Branch of the New Orleans District, and is also a regional technical specialist for climate change adaptation for the Mississippi Valley Division. He has worked with the USAC Climate Preparedness and Resilience Community of Practice since 2012 and has been, been serving as its acting lead since February 2021. In addition to leading the Climate Preparedness and Resilience Community of Practice, Mr. Veach's responsibilities include river forecasting, data management, and supporting engineering studies and designs with statistical analyses of river flow, precipitation, and coastal water levels. As a technical specialist, Will supports teams throughout USACE with integration of climate adaptation and resilience into designs and other studies and through ATR and policy compliance reviews. He is a national subject matter expert in the areas of sea level change adaptation and inland hydrology non-stationarity, is a member of numerous interagency teams and has served on international partnerships missions in the Netherlands, Brazil, and South Korea. Mr. Veach holds a BA degree in environmental studies with a focus in hydrology from the University of Colorado and an MS degree in hydrology from the University of Arizona. He is a registered professional hydrologist with the American Institute of Hydrology and we are so thankful you are here today. Thank you. Our second panelist is Tyler Anthrop, and um, Tyler is the Director of Planning and Strategy for the Sewage and Water Board of New Orleans, where he oversees strategic and system planning. He has a decade of experience in sustainable urban water management, mostly working in New Orleans to implement green infrastructure solutions to flooding. He previously served as the Urban Water Program Manager in, with the City of New Orleans Office of Resilience and Sustainability and as a planner of the City Planning Commission at a, and at the CGR Incorporated. He works, his work has included development and implementation of New Orleans' first stormwater code, works and plans and such as the, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> work on plans such as the New Orleans um, Main Street Resilience Plan, Housing NOLA, and author authorizing the economic benefits section of the Greater New Orleans Urban Water Plan. He holds a master's degree in sustainable real um, estate development from Tulane University and a bachelor's degree in urban planning and design from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Next up, we have this lovely pair from Mastodon, which is a stormwater management and construction company with a vision of a city that embraces water while also creating urban ecosystems that can improve the quality of life for a community. Mastodon seeks to provide a holistic approach to historic renovations and stormwater management systems. 
while also calling attention to environmental and socioeconomic justice issues by offering apprenticeships to minority youth and community, establishing a lab garden for research and development to tackle local stormwater and food desert issues, and hosting educational workshops and programming for the community. Arian Hall is a Baton Rouge native who attended Loyola University, New Orleans, with a focus of, in arts of, of arts in music. During her work teaching with various orchestra nonprofits after college, Arian learned of the AmeriCorps program and the great benefit assisting in rebuilding New Orleans could provide. While working with the St. Bernard Project, she gained hard skills in carpentry, building, and reading architectural plans. In 2015, Arian retained an install position with Evans and Leiter Landscape Architecture, where she received training in permaculture practices, sustainability, and construction of stormwater management systems. She now holds over six years of experience in the construction and stormwater management field. And she is paired with Luisa Abale, who hails from bustling New York and is a graduate of Fordham University, where she studied sociology and visual arts with a concentration in painting and drawing. While at Fordham, she became passionate about service work and diversity peer education. She continued this work upon moving to New Orleans in 2011 first serving in AmeriCorps and then as a carpentry manager at SBP. Permaculture techniques and stormwater management became a focus as well as flooding posed a constant threat for homeowners that Louisa encountered that were attempting to rebuild. Louisa joined Evans and Leiter a team as a project manager in 2015, where she continues to gain knowledge and expertise installing stormwater management systems and landscapes. Louisa is a licensed horticulturist and has a pas passion for teaching the skills of the trade in stormwater and ecological systems. Thank you, too, thank you so much for being here. Our next panelist is uh, Willie Altman, originally from Meridian, Mississippi. Willie moved to New Orleans in 1989. Prior to Hurricane Katrina, who worked as a scheduler with the Regional Transit Authority. After Katrina, Willie, like many New Orleans, lost his job, but, the, but he decided to stay in New Orleans to help rebuild the city. Um, heeding the advice of his mother, who used to say, learn how to do more than one thing. Willie turned to construction skills he learned as a young man and served as a construction manager for various youth build programs in New Orleans and the surrounding areas. According to Willie, what he enjoys most about working with young adults is seeing them gain the confidence and skills that they need to be success successful in their lives. Willie holds a Bachelor's of Science in Education and Technology from Jackson State University and has a few certifications, National Center for Construction Education and Research, Clear Water Certification, and Building Performance and Building Performance Institution Certification. Um, he continues to live with his family in New Orleans. Thank you for coming, Willie. What is this? Oh. And poor Willie just found out he was coming today because his boss is Chuck Morissette, the executive director of Thrive New Orleans, and um, he had an emergency come up. So thank you for coming last minute. We appreciate it so much. And lastly, our next panelist is Sam, a 2019 Loyola graduate and is the Urban Conservancy Program Manager for the Front Yard Initiative and Building Active Stewardship in New Orleans Programs. The, FY, the FYI is an incentive and educational program that helps homeowners remove impermeable surface from their properties and install green infrastructure to help reduce localized flooding. Basin is a water stewardship pro summer program for school age children that teaches living with water, principles through fun and experimental learning. Sam graduated with honors from Loyola University, New Orleans with a bachelor's degree in environmental science with a concentration in biological sciences and is a fellow from the Institute for v Environmental Communication, is GIP certified and is currently becoming a master naturalist. She is personally and professionally invested in creating a more resilient Water Smart New Orleans. Thank you all for coming. Hi, I'm Olivia Guerra. I'm a sophomore here at Loyola. I'm an environment student studying with a concentration in biology. 
and I'm here to ask you guys your first question. What role does your organization play in water management of southeastern Louisiana? Yes, we're going this way. So we can go in order if you would like. Actually, for this first question, let's go in order because I placed y'all in order for a reason. The feds, <laughs> then the city, and we go from there, okay? So the feds are first, and then after that, we'll just take it in any order. Sound good? Sounds right. good. Um, well, thank you for that uh, very warm welcome. It's my pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, what, you knew it had to be an Army uh, communication because there was an undefined acronym in there, so I apologize for the ATR. <laughs> That's agency technical review, I should have put that in there. Um, the other thing that I left out of, of the bio is that I'm also a 2011 fellow of the Institute for Environmental Communication. So great to see you, Dr. Thomas and Dr. Thomas. Um, <laughs> it's great to be back at Loyola. So um, actually the, the 2011 year that I was a fellow was, a, was an interesting one because it was the largest flood in the history of the Mississippi River, largest flood measured anyway. The uh, 27 flood would have been larger if it had been contained in the levees, but um, so that year I was balancing trying to be an environmental communications fellow with water management. And I think in New Orleans, when we think about water management, we often think about stormwater management, local water management in our streets. And the Corps of Engineers doesn't typically get involved in that scale of water management. There's a rule, it's in our uh, legal authorities called the 800 CFS rule. And it says that if your river or water course doesn't have a 10-year flood of at least 800 cubic feet per second, it's not a federal responsibility. It's not a core responsibility. It's not any federal agency's responsibility. It's a local responsibility. But there's a unique uh, project in New Orleans called the Southeast Louisiana Project that was specifically authorized. Um, so it doesn't have to abide by that rule. And uh, in any case, I think some streets in New Orleans would meet it anyhow. But um, because of a flood that happened in May of 1995, there was a uh, uh, the specific project that was authorized to improve drainage uh, in New Orleans. And so the Corps of Engineers here, but not in most places, is involved in local stormwater management um, in terms of conveying water to the, to the perimeter. And then of course, in the entire uh, hurricane and storm damage risk reduction system that sort of keeps water out on a day-to-day -day basis and closes down uh, for storms to keep stormwater out. Um, but in, on top of that, the Corps of Engineers does also have a very big role in water management, but on a different scale, a larger scale. So uh, projects like the Mississippi River and Tributaries Project that includes the Bonacary Spillway, the Morganza Floodway, um, the Old River Control Complex, these are sort of the really big water management uh, projects that I think oftentimes operate kind of in the background for a lot of people. I think people in this room are, are aware of them. And if you're in one of the programs that I just heard about, I'm sure you've learned all about them. But I think for a lot of people, sort of the, the uh, larger river systems of the United States get managed kind of uh, silently and, and in the background. But um, if you're interested in, in that kind of thing, I really encourage you to, to read up on uh, some of these large water management projects, because it's really fascinating. And um, I really am glad to hear that we've got some uh, environmental studies majors here because I was an environmental studies undergraduate and now I work with all of these engineers. And we are so important, us liberal arts majors in that room, you know. Uh, engineers love to fix things, but their favorite way to fix things is to try it and see. And I'm usually the one who has to come in and say, wait, that's, that's not a question. You know, it's not a testable hypothesis, you know. Let's, um, let's look at the bigger picture here. So if you're interested in that kind of thing, I really encourage you to pursue whatever avenue you're interested in professionally. Um, you can be an engineer, you can be a scientist. Um, it's, it's really worked out well for me. So um, those are just a few things. And then, of course, as you mentioned in my intro, I'm currently leading the Climate Preparedness and Resilience um, program for the Corps of Engineers. Uh, which is just a huge honor, and it's really an amazing time to be working in that space. So I would also just add that the other way that the Corps is involved in water management is in terms of building in climate preparedness into all of our projects, whether it's sea level rise or consideration of uh, changes in flow frequency and rain, rain frequency. Um, you know, we can't just build based on the data we collected 
in the past or even in the present. Uh, we really have to build for the climate of the future when this project has to be counted on uh, to perform. So those are just a few ways that, that our organization is involved. Um, I'd like to hear from the other panels and I'd be happy to take questions, of course. Yeah, uh, and thanks again as well to, for the invite tonight. Um, I think this is the first in-person panel I've been to in a long time, so it's, it's a bit strange, but it's nice. Um, obviously, the role that our organization plays in water management in southeastern Louisiana is, is pretty huge, um, at least for the city of New Orleans. Um, you know, when we were created about 120 years ago, uh, we were really the governance model for the world in terms of how to form a public, accountable, um, public water and wastewater utility. Um, w w our governance model, in fact, was the model that the Amsterdam Water Board is created off of. Um, and so we're sort of unusual in the water um, space in that we are an independent public utility, um, and we also manage drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater. Um, most other places, there's a water utility, there's a wastewater utility. Um, they're usually separate entities. They usually don't um, work on all three issues at the same time. And so the big buzzword right now in the water utility world is one water, um, and how can we merge all of these three um, disparate but obviously very interrelated systems together. And so um, the Sewage and Water Board is, is sort of a model still to this day in terms of how you can merge um, all three of these different areas to integrate the management of water in all three ways. Um, but so, you know, the, the role that we play locally is obviously huge, as all of you that live locally know, um, in that we provide you with clean and safe drinking water on a daily basis. We take your sewage and we remove it for safe return to the environment. Um, and we partner with the city of New Orleans to drain stormwater um, as best as possible from the streets. Um, obviously, given the, the unique challenges that we face here, it's sometimes that one is uh, a little more difficult than the other two. Um, but so in terms of, of you know, the, the role that we play f within the bounds of the, the levees in New Orleans, um, we sort of touch every single drop of water at some point in the cycle. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thanks for having us here. Um, so what role do we play? We're an installation company. We the, the local installation. Buying into city infrastructure. Um, we're trying to help alleviate that, that pumping system uh, during these really big rain events. Yeah, so we essentially build and design systems for our clients to help manage water. Sorry, <clears throat> I'm a little nervous. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're your boots on the ground. We're a private construction company. Louise is a licensed horticulturalist. I'm a, a pervious concrete certified technician. And um, yeah, we build, we pretty much uh, try to hold the water as close to where it falls as possible. And that can look like several dis different systems. We can excavate with equipment to create void spaces in the ground to hold the water, or we can do it with uh, living systems, with bioswales. Uh, Rain gardens, uh, <laughs> you name it, bioretentions. <laughs> Fresh drains, yeah, all sorts of, uh, all sorts of mitigations. What do you mean? <laughs> uh, good evening, thank you guys for having me. Um, that I was thrown into the fire earlier, but I guess that's what it is. It is what it is. Uh, at Thrive, we work in the community. We work with the community, communities, and there are a lot of people that are unemployed right now, or underemployed, uh, from the ages 18 to 45, 50, 60 years old. You know, here where Thrive has an opportunity to introduce those individuals to green infrastructure. So we use with the work, we work with the workforce in order to get people employed and to learn a trade where they can make decent money, you know, starting from twelve dollars on up. You know, uh, like I tell young people all the time, don't think because you get a clear water certification, you're gonna go and make thirty four dollars an hour. That ain't happening. You know, uh, but uh, Thrive uh, deals with the community. We help our community and how we are our role uh, in organizing this is training individuals to do this work. We have two great trainers here that went through Green uh, Thrive Green Academy for the business side. And Years it, ago. <laughs> yeah, and it works. It's living proof. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, thank you for inviting Sam, me. I'm going to introduce. Uh, in, I'm going to interrupt for a minute, Willie. If you would tell um, the, I know it was in the intro, but tell what Thrive New Orleans does with the city, with the um, what y'all are doing in Gentilly. Oh yes, uh, Thrive is the resilient general, uh, general contractor for the city of New Orleans. We did get lucky enough to do that. And uh, working with different uh, homeowners in the city, uh, doing green gardens, uh, arrangements. Yeah, CAP's a really cool program. Um, so yeah, thank you for inviting me to come speak. Uh, as Vera Lane said, I work for the Urban Conservancy. I do the Front Yard Initiative and the Basin Program. And our role is kind of on the education and incentive size of it. Uh, so we are trying to get residents to learn about green infrastructure. And we don't want the Sewage and Water Board to have to touch every single drop of water. You know, that is why we flood. So we're trying to help them out on the residential end by getting, you know, just spreading the word about living with water principles. Uh, Basin particularly works with younger kids um, because, you know, some of this stuff you don't learn until you're adult and that's a little ridiculous when you live in a place like New Orleans. Um, we also try to work with a lot of the people on the panel currently. Uh, we love Macedon and Thrive and, you know, we love the Sewage and Water Board and Army Corps too, but <laughs> um, we don't work with this one. But, um, yeah, so we're a little bit more on the residential side because we all have a part to play in dealing with water in New Orleans. Hi, my name is Skylar Jones, and over the summer I participated in Loyola Academy, and I was a counselor for Basin. Um, I go to Lusher. I'm a junior, and... My question is, how does your organization contribute to ecological health and or societal impacts? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so I guess I'll just start off again. Um, so I don't know if any of y'all have ever done a big home improvement project, but it's a little overwhelming. Uh, you want to get the right guys for the job. You don't know where to start always. Maybe you just don't know what the right thing to do is. So kind of a big role of ours is to help connect residents with resources, technical assistance, and as I said, financial assistance. Um, so this stuff can get pretty expensive, and that's unfortunate because I do think everyone, you know, in New Orleans should have green infrastructure. So our part is bringing it to, you know, anyone who is very interested in it. Um, and yeah, I, yeah, I'll stop there. I'm, I'm going to ask if you will define for the audience what green infrastructure is, because I decided to not, in, um, you know, explain that so y'all could tell. And then you just gave some examples of some things and then it, it might make more sense. Sure, I'll give my definition of green infrastructure and then I guess everyone can give theirs. Um, it is a water management system that mimics uh, the natural water cycle to manage stormwater. Uh, it does this by detaining, retaining, and filtering that stormwater. Um, that's my short definition. Pretty legit. Yeah, I thanks. agree with what she said. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's like textbook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Plain to say. That was her senior thesis. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so ultimately our organization um, can uh, uh, impact the ecological health of our society because we plant pollinators, trees that drink up a lot of water, that clean the air. Um, we create uh, natural spaces within an urban environment, which is really important because animals don't have a lot of places to go. <laughs> um, yeah, what else, Louisa? <laughs> Well, uh, for societal impacts, I mean, we tie directly into a lot of nonprofit work as well. Um, we speak a lot to um, different cohorts that come through launch, uh, as well as LA Green Corps, a couple other uh, workforce development nonprofits, Waterwise. Water um, so I think a large part of what we do is also education. We're educating a workforce, but we also have to educate them. Uh, they don't necessarily always know. They know they want something, but they don't know what. 
it. <laughs> or they know and they like, have a problem, yeah. but they don't know any of the steps to initiate the screening. A lot of times, uh, when people see flooding, they figure, oh, I need to go up higher, I need to add more dirt, and that's not the answer. Um, I just look at it as, you know, the clean water with the health thing, uh, it's healthy water, healthy people. Um, but it's everything they say. Arian, you said that um, you're a pervious pavement technician. Hmm. Will you explain to everybody what that means? I had to say it slowly to get it right. <laughs> yeah, so I went through a course to get certified to install uh, pervious concrete, which is an, it's simi very similar to traditional concrete, but you install it completely differently. <laughs> Um, you can use it for driveways and parking areas. They don't usually use it for drivable roads. Um, it's just not made for that level of uh, wear and tear. But um, it's, it's a porous concrete. It mainly gets its strength from the aggregate that's inside of it. And the way I would describe how it looks, it kind of looks like Rice Krispie Treat. If you were to look at a cross section of it, and you can see where the water can infiltrate through the, the, the porosity of the, the actual concrete itself. So where are some places y'all have put it so that if anybody wanted to go and look? I know that's where we met um, Chuck, who's the executive director of Thrive New Orleans, and then met you, Arian, um, on a project um, on Galvez Street. So Jerusalem Church, right? Yeah, I, I didn't pour it, but they could go check it out at one of Thrive's projects. Yeah, at Jerusalem. Where? Jerusalem where? First, um, Just the little parking areas? Yeah, do you know where, what intersection it is? I would have yeah. to get back South to you Gal on the address. South, Gal <laughs> South Galvez and near it. And um, Louisiana Avenue. Where is it? Washington? It's Washington. I think it's Washington. Yeah, it's Washington. First, okay. Yeah, Washington. <laughs> you get mixed up. Did you guys yeah, get that? Also, all in, all in um, where's that, Hoffman Triangle right now, they did a huge install. All of the parking bays in that area are all pervious concrete. For some, if you want to see larger examples of it, it's... We're still a small, small business. We've only been in existence for about three and a half years. So I'm still, I actually only put in one bid for pervious concrete thus far, which makes sense because there's not a lot of residential clients that are installing it yet. It, you're finding that it's more private, commercial, and municipal installations. So getting there. <laughs> Uh, well, sort of in a, a different uh, way, you know, if you think about the role that water utilities play in the world, they were sort of like the, um, the original like public health um, and environmental organizations um, and that our core mission is to provide safe and clean drinking water and um, treat wastewater and return it to the environment in a safe and healthy way. Um, and so, you know, that's, again, like the very core of, of an essence of what we do on a daily basis is ensure that, you know, people have water to drink and that the sewage isn't piling up in the streets like it did before we existed. Um, and so in terms of, you know, what, how our organization contributes to the ecological and so societal health of, of the community, you know, we kind of make it possible for the community to exist in a lot of ways um, in terms of, you know, sustaining life here with, with water and wastewater treatment and, and draining of stormwater. So um, it's very elemental what we do. Maybe, um, and, and I'm throwing this out there, so hopefully you know a little bit about it, but we um, visited the Paul Haven School on the West Bank this summer with our program. Can you tell people about some of those installs that y'all have done as an organization? Sure, yeah. The Sewage and Water Board um, has done quite a bit of green infrastructure work around the city through um, a grant program that we created, I think, in beginning in 2012. Um, so we've spent about $5 million so far on green infrastructure installs. Um, the Haven School, one on the West Bank, I think we're actually cutting the ribbon on that next week. Um, so look out for that. Um, it's a, a really large scale, probably the largest project we've done so far, um, really turning the entire schoolyard um, of a charter school over there in Algiers into a large scale uh, detention facility and educational facility. Um, and so we're really excited about that. And, and it's the first project where we have also been able to install a lot of monitoring equipment and, and samplers and things like that so that we can really um, understand the science behind green infrastructure and, and really make sure that um, as we continue to implement green infrastructure, we can use it appropriately to meet 
um, our Clean Water Act permit responsibilities and all of the compliance that we are also responsible for um, through federal regulations. But um, yeah, so the you know the Sewage and Water Board has contributed to green infrastructure on the drainage side of things in, in many ways, including you know seeding funding to nonprofits in in the first few years to groups like WaterWise um, and creating lots of public education and outreach around green infrastructure. Um, yeah, that's that's really been our involvement in green infrastructure. Called Paul Habens Charter School. H A B A N S yeah. Habens. I think it's one that's been renamed, but I don't know the new name. No, I think that's the old name. No. But it, it's also once they it's cut the ribbon, it's going to be open to the public after school hours. But it's going to be used for education during the school day as well. It's really neat if you go there because they left a tree just on it's a big tree so that they can study the decay process and this, they can use it in their science classes. So. Um, we visited it over the summer with Loyola Ac Academy and it, it's really beautiful. And yeah, it's something you should really go check out. If you, yeah, I, I live in Algiers, so it's really nice to see a project like that because Algiers really doesn't have any kind of parks or anything. So I was really happy to see it. I also like to add that they planted thousands of plants there. Real nice. If you get a chance, go visit. Well, um, in terms of ecological health and societal impacts, the, the Army Corps of Engineers is sort of the nation's engineering and construction company, which means it's kind of all your company, too, with a few levels of management in between. Um, so I think it we get in the news a lot on this front in a negative way um, as a sort of a, a consequence or byproduct of doing engineering projects. Um, but what maybe some people don't maybe not realize is that the Army Corps also has an authorized, uh, congressionally authorized mission to do ecosystem restoration. So there are ecosystem restoration projects around the country that are executed by the Corps of Engineers um, to basically make uh, landscapes more natural make them more like they would have been in their more natural state. On top of that, when an engineering project is, is performed, whether it's a levee or um, a wall or a, a dam or something, um, there's always an environmental mitigation piece that has to occur as well. So there's always uh, some multiple of whatever amount of land is impacted has to be restored as a, as a part of that. So that's also an ecological impact. Um, the Corps also has a, a, a large and growing program of beneficial use of dredged material. There's a lot of sand and sediment that's dredged out of rivers and navigation channels around the country to make them passable for navigation. And that material has to go somewhere. And there's a growing uh, application of that to create wetlands um, and create ecosystems uh, that can be a, a co-benefit of those navigation projects. Um, in terms of societal impacts, I think I could give the same answer Tyler gave, which is that we sort of make it possible for society to exist in some places. Um, on top of that, the, the way that the projects are planned is in terms of net benefits to the nation. So um, one thing about our agency is that projects have to return more value to the country than they cost. So that really gets down to societal impacts. but. It, it's sort of societal impacts as they could be measured in dollars. And to address that, you know, narrow-mindedness, there are other what we call uh, accounts that also take into account um, environmental acceptability, environmental justice, um, uh, national development as well as regional economic development. So it's, it's a difficult thing, but, they're, what, but we're trying and we're trying to get better at it in terms of accounting for all of these different sorts of benefits when we're doing a project. And I'll just also mention that the, the current administration is very uh, active and, and very excited about environmental justice. Um, there have been executive orders issued and we're working with the White House and trying to um, figure out what the implementation is gonna look like. Yeah. <laughs> so making sure that the, that the greatest negative effects of these projects don't always fall on the most disadvantaged communities. So that's you know one of our highest priorities we're working on right now. A 
Okay, so your next question is going to be, how has water management changed in New Orleans in the past 10 to 20 years? Yeah, in the last five years, right? <laughs> for, for the people who are doing the install work, for me, what I've noticed is a lot of more like public projects have rolled out that directly relate to stormwater management and green infrastructure. Um, and that they were talking about the Cap Gentilly projects, but I've even heard about some RFPs with bridge and water board folks um, with some big projects that y'all have going on, which is really awesome. Um, and also, Green Corps and Groundwork are doing a big project like on St. Bernard and Broad right now. They're doing a giant bioswale that has just passed St. by Bernard. itself. St. Bernard and Claiborne. Yeah, St. Bernard and Claiborne. Um, uh, code enforcement. So the 1.25 inch <laughs> uh, rain, rain that um, property owners are supposed to store. You see a lot of people that actually know about it now and are trying to do their part, you know, the level of like stewardship to actually hold and retain their own water on their own properties. And that's not just like commercial properties. These are residences as well. Um, Say that number again for us. 1.25 inches. In one hour. In one hour. Um, and in general, you just see a lot of popularity growing, like a lot more people that know about what green infrastructure and stormwater management is. And they come to you with or they come to us with this, with a basic knowledge or a basic understanding, but still, again, this level of stewardship, I wanna be doing the right thing as a New Orleanian, as, as a member of my community to hold water as close to where it's falling, to take to ease the stress on the pumping system. And that's what we try to stress the most is that what we do isn't gonna completely mitigate localized <coughs> flooding, but it can significantly reduce the amount of stress that we're putting on the pumps. And it can, it can save property and save save things at times, you know? If you can hold three inches of water on your property, then if you have a three inch rain event, you don't see that water. So that's something that people have to take into account also. Like Aaron said, uh, saving money is the biggest thing uh, in New Orleans and all over the world. So the government has spent $14.5 billion building pump stations and all this other stuff. And uh, so Aaron and her team and Sewage and Water Board and their team does this thing that kind of ease the pain of the wallet. In other words, so we can do our part by doing the French drain and having water to drain where it should go. But into all the, where it goes into the pipes, but there's only so much water the pipes can take at a time. You know, being in New Orleans, you know how the pumping system works, but try to do less stress than. Yeah, like a lot of the organizations that we might be name dropping, like Groundwork or Greenlight or Waterwise or us, you know, we just started focusing on water management five or ten years ago. Like, I think even Thrive. So, like, five, ten years ago, you didn't see green contractors like Mastodon or, you know, Evans and Lighter. So, it's definitely growing in popularity. It's growing in common knowledge. Um, and we're just learning more. And I mean, I don't, I'm, you know, uh, the sewage and water board and Army Corps will definitely be able to talk more about this. But, you know, I don't remember hearing about all these wetlands restoration that they're doing now and, you know, trying to focus more on mitigating climate change, recognizing how that is affecting us, you know, as a coastal community. Um, I just feel like the conversation wasn't really circling around that 20 years ago. Yeah, I mean, when I started out um, in this field a little over 10 years ago, I remember, you know, like sitting at the Sewage and Water Board office with Marcia St. Martin trying to explain what a rain garden was. Um, if you would have told me that I was going to be sitting here with a Sewage and Water Board shirt on telling you about the work that we're doing, then I probably would have laughed you out of the room. Um, but, you know, the, it's it's been a, a completely different change. And I think that the, the the two biggest things that I think have changed the most are just sort of a general literacy around water issues in New Orleans. Um, so, you know, whereas 10 years ago we were, you know, sort of activists pushing for um, these large institutions to make change, and now we're talking about, you know, city council demanding that, you know, we do more on green infrastructure because the public is demanding it and people are campaigning on it. Um, and so it's become, you know, a really popular public issue. And I think the other thing has just been 
the exposure of the decrepit state of our infrastructure over the last 10 years. I think that people didn't really realize um, at that time that things were quite as bad as they are. Um, and I don't think that people really realized how we got in the situation that we're in now where, you know, for instance, our, our revenues today are less than they were in the 80s by inflation because we went so long without rate increases in, in the 80s and 90s. Um, and so now that bill is coming due. Um, and so I think that that's, you know, becoming more um, realized in this community and, and especially at the federal level with the stuff the administration's doing on federal funding for projects. But I think those are probably the biggest changes I've noticed in my career. Um, I would say in the last <clears throat> 20 or maybe 40 years, um, the sort of the, I think the biggest change was the recognition that subsidence is made worse by overpumping. And um, I don't know if it falls into this 10 or 20 window, but I think it's, it's still something that is being fully recognized only with the emergence of long-term data sets that show uh, how soils become dehydrated and oxidized when they're, when they're overly dried, and so why it's necessary to keep water tables higher um, as much as possible. Um, and then, of course, since Hurricane Katrina, I think the recognition of, you know, coming out of the Dutch dialogues and, and coming into, leading into the urban water plan, um, the need to live with water, I think those are sort of all among the biggest uh, water management changes in New Orleans recently. I think that with green infrastructure, um, with any infrastructure, it's always more complicated uh, than it looks at first. And I think that this nascent uh, business ecosystem that's really just growing right now is gonna provide so much information that we're gonna learn about how these systems work, how they're managed and maintained. Um, I think sometimes, I'm a big fan of green infrastructure. I'm a big fan of, of ecosystems. I think sometimes there is an, a little bit of a over-optimism about what kinds of problems can be solved with green infrastructure alone. And I think that everyone would rather have a nice uh, vegetation band next to their house than a wall. And I think that this is something that we're still learning about. You know, how do these systems perform out into the future? How do they work in concert with the gray infrastructure pieces? Um, what kind of maintenance are they going to take? What kind of expertise, what kind of workforce is it going to take um, to maintain these green systems? And um, I'm excited. I think it's something that we're going to learn a lot more about um, going forward. So I kind of, I feel like the 10 to 20 year window is sort of interesting because I feel like we're kind of more in, the, in it now. Um, you know, the, the, the lessons of what we're doing right now, I think, are going to be just absolutely critical going forward uh, in the next sort of generation plus uh, and how our systems look, you know, how our built and natural environments look. Maybe you could expand upon that and say, what, what do you, how will it change in the next 10 years, maybe? Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, I'm, any number. How will it change in our lifetime? Yeah. Um, I mean, it, I, that's a hard question, I'm sure, but what do y'all think from yeah. your perspective of what you do every day to protect us from water issues? Well, I think, I think Yogi Berra might have said that predictions are always difficult, especially when the future is involved. Mm -hmm. And um, in, the, in the climate preparedness world, the, the kind of the, the irony that we're constantly dealing with is that every year, every month, you know, we learn more. And so, in a sense, we're getting more understanding and sort of less uncertainty over time, although not less uncertainty every day because sometimes you find out about things you didn't know you didn't know. Um, so your uncertainty gets bigger for a little bit and then it gets smaller again. But at the same time as we're going along, we're, the climate is changing more. So it's like we're never catching up. We're never getting to a point where a given number of years in the future, we're more sure um, what's going on. So I think that where we're going is, is going to be all about how we can operate in this deep uncertainty, 
how can we use, how can we embrace uncertainty? And instead of hiding it or running away from it, how can we make decisions where we're gonna have you know, low regrets, we're gonna have many different kinds of benefits, we're gonna be in you know, good shape no matter how things play out within the reasonably plausible range of what we think uh, things might look like. And I think that is sort of the, the next frontier of how do you get away from trying to pinpoint what's gonna happen before you make a decision and find ways to make decisions collaboratively um, you know, with the whole community, with lots of different benefit types uh, considered. From your perspective, anyone else want to tackle that one? What is it going to be like in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? I don't know what it's going to be like, but where we could kind of move towards is um, start looking at multiple benefits. Um, Gray infrastructure is great. We couldn't be here the way we've built, you know, our society without it. But um, you know, other types of infrastructure that will have multiple benefits outside of just stormwater management, because gray infrastructure is only really great for managing our stormwater. But if we can start looking at you know parking lots as not a necessity, um, start building a city that is for people first and you know cars second bike lanes you know just once you start designing your city in a way that's looking for multiple benefits you just end up with something different than what we have um, also i guess working towards net zero since that's um something we should be working towards soon <laughs> mitigating climate change yeah and that's one of the, the positive things about green infrastructure is that you have stacked functions. You know, a parking lot can hold thousands and thousands of stormwater, you know, so stormwater runoff, or a park. Um, so many different applications. Future bills, I mean, building buildings, uh, building grocery stores. Um, one of the biggest regrets, I, I had nothing to do with it, was when they built Costco's out there. I mean, that's too much concrete. I mean, that's, that's I mean, that would have been a perfect site, great example for green infrastructure if they would have done pavers there instead of all of the concrete. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing just more sustainable products and more product options. I mean, I feel like every day I'm like asking myself questions about like the sustainability of like what we use, you know, for a lot of our retention systems, we're using limestone. Where does limestone come from? I mean, we use sand, it's river sand. Does it come from dredging? Yeah. Dan, <laughs> <Can>, yeah. <laughs> the river leaves it in the spillway for us. But we're now using the glass from Glass Half Full too, which is right. great. Um, Willie, based on what you just said and, and what Arian said earlier about um, individuals have to be able to retain one point, or what is it, 1.25 1 per? Inches per hour. Hour, thank you. I need to commit that to memory. Um, <laughs> what is it for businesses? So when you're building for businesses, uh, what it, what are they, is there it's a plan? Same, is there a part of the permit? The it's the same yeah. one. It's the same. Cold, right? Isn't it that cold? For the city, single, I think it's the city. It's single is, family properties are not required to hold one, the 1.25. It's, it's only commercial properties and multifamily properties. And so what is the amount? Or just they have to be net zero? So the, the requirement is um, that you have to detain the first inch and a quarter of rain that falls in that first hour, and your runoff rate can't be higher than pre-development for a 10-year storm. Da da da. Is it enforced? I don't think it is. He would know that question better than us. <laughs> I, I no longer work for the city of New Orleans. I don't. I don't want to speak for them. Um, I did. I wrote the code, but um, I'm not involved in the enforcement today. I do see a lot of projects, though, that have stormwater built in. You know, you look like, for instance, I was just at the um, the new Rouse's on Ferret Street the other day, and all the parking stalls there are permeable. Concrete that all parking stalls have to be built in. Uh, 
Okay. Um, the last question is, what are the most critical ch changes that need to be made in our communities and how can citizens contribute? So this one I'm most excited to hear what my fellow panelists have to say. I've been really racking my brain on this one. I just wrote a list. Um, so we'll see if everyone agrees yeah, no, with my right? list. I just, my thoughts were we're a drop in the bucket as far as the long, you know, the, the total solution, the long-term solution, because, you know, these guys have a large part to play in what happens with what, what we do in residences and small commercial projects. Um, but I think that education is key right now because a lot of people just don't don't know we're very ignorant to to um some of the things that we could be doing to be living more sustainably and green infrastructure is definitely especially in our urban environment something that we should be installing everywhere um and citizens as far as us here getting involved i mean you got some great resources here fyi urban conservancy um waterwise soul there's lots of ways to get involved, but I would just say if you're interested, just start there. Master naturalists, <laughs> just start by getting involved and asking those hard questions. Um, that's how Louisa started started spurring my interest in all of this, because I, I thought it was some kind of, when they said French drain, I thought it was some kind of bidet or something. I don't know what it was. <laughs> but, but yeah, so. What about you, Mr. Willis? I just, I just feel the same thing. Uh, Community need to be educated, um, a little know-how, uh, take interest, uh, come to thrive, learn about it, um, help clean out your catch basins at your house, do a lot of rainwater. It rains a lot. Get a barrel. You know, it just it brings me back. I, my, back in the days, uh, my mom used to put a bucket outside to catch rain, like. Going on with you? Why you got put this much? <laughs> Why you got to put it in the rain? You know, to catch the rainwater, to put on the plants. You know, like she was thinking way ahead of time. You know, and it makes sense to me now because I think about those things that like that people and they actually caught water in the barrel coming out to drain it. And uh, I like wow. So here it is, forty, fifty years old, telling my age now. Uh, but yeah, 50, 50 years later, 60 years later, you know, here we are, we're talking about saving water. Uh, Dr. George Washington Carver said, uh, people in the U.S. are the world, most wasteful peoples in the world. And we still are wasting a lot of water, not doing nothing with, with the water, or how to retain it, to let it drain later. And it can be healthier for us, even with on water, you know, it picks up everything, you know. The gasoline has been spilled, you know. The grease that someone to throw down the catch basin, the grass, you know. I saw a guy doing that the other day, and I mean, I know he got real upset with me. I said, but if I see you doing that again, I'm going to report you. <laughs> 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 Taking this grass and putting it down the drain. You know? Do you realize we live in New Orleans? You know, we got cars down there, everything, you know, so. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if the community get involved, get get educated, but I think we we need to educate them. Um, but, but today's world, you know, the phone right at your hand, Google. You know, you can do a lot with it. But I'm like Aaron, uh, when I first People started hearing about People don't know what they don't know. <laughs> right, right, so, that's right, they can't. You're right, so we need to educate. Um, yeah, I'll keep going, but I have a follow-up question for y'all because I want to know, how we can educate people of you know different age groups in different communities and things like that too. That's important. Well, I think it should just be in schools. It's the easiest way to get it started and make sure everyone learns it is that just have a you know water literate children <laughs> tell them adults what's up. There. Yeah, that'd be a good oh, place really? to start. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, I was looking forward to this question, too, about, you know, critical changes that need to be made and how people can contribute. I think that, um, you know, like I was saying earlier, I think that the last 10 years have really exposed a lot of our, of our weaknesses. Um, and I think that we are long overdue for a conversation about how we want to adapt and fix our systems. 
Um, and I think that, you know, um, for instance, in the drainage side of the house for us on an annual basis, we run a 50 to $60 million deficit. Um, and of course we can't run a deficit. So that just means we're deferring costs. Um, and so that's $60 million worth of improvements in the system that just aren't happening that need to happen on an annual basis. And that's how we end up with, you know, pumps that are failing and power systems that don't work and feeders that don't work and, um, all kinds of, you know, problems in the system is we just have to keep deferring that maintenance because we can't invent money out of thin air. Um, and so I think we really, yeah, you guys can, but we can't. Um, well, uh, Congress can for you, but, um, you know, the, the, this is a, it's a huge, huge problem. And, and the fact that, you know, we get all of our revenue from drainage from property taxes alone, um, a lot of folks don't realize that um, drainage doesn't appear in your water bill. Um, no penny of, of any money that you pay in your monthly water bill goes towards drainage. Um, and there's a huge proportion of people in the city who don't pay for drainage because they don't pay property taxes. And most of those are, you know, the, the institution at the building that we're sitting in today. Um, it includes, you know, the archdiocese. It includes lots of nonprofit-owned properties. Um, and so, you know, there, there really needs to be a conversation about the equity in that system and, and how we want to... Um, be able to fund the improvements that need to be made at the larger scale so that we can also help out the smaller scale um, folks as well and make sure that it's, it's equitable for all of us. Well, I feel like when it comes to managing water and managing floods, flood risk, um, everyone has a part to play. Um, it's really the whole chain of Federal, state, local, nonprofit, um, educational, you know, down to the individual. Everyone has a piece of that, of that management. And for, for citizens, for individuals, I think education is key, but I think just communication is key. Um, one thing that the, that the Corps of Engineers has done in the last 10, 15 years is change the language that we use. Um, we try not to use the word protection anymore. Um, it gives people a sense that there's no risk, and of course there can never be no risk. Um, there can never be a sure thing. So we talk about risk management. And um, risk, when you, when, you know, people, instead of talking about a 100-year event, you know, a 100-year flood, which makes people think that it only happens once every 100 years on the century, um, you know, we talk about a 1% annual chance event or annual probability event. But once you start using more and more syllables, some people are already lost. And I think it's really helpful for citizens to talk to your neighbors, talk to your family, help them understand. Because it's confusing enough to talk about a 1% annual chance, but with climate change, the chances are changing over, over time. So, you know, I think, I think we're all aware um, you know, this, this flood that has a 1% chance of, a ca of happening in a, in a year, it's got like a 25% chance of happening in a 30-year mortgage. Well, just start accelerating that chances, um, you know, exponentially, and now that communication just became exponentially more difficult. So you can all help by educating yourselves and by helping educate your family, your neighbors, your community, uh, people who may need help understanding that they may need to get insurance. They may need to get a rain barrel. They may need to have an evacuation plan. They may need to have somewhere to move their car. Um, you know, these are all things that we can help each other do. Um, and I think no matter what we choose to do on the infrastructure front, those kind of community building, communication building of, uh, activities will always be important. Any other panelists want to uh, say a statement about the critical changes? I think uh, touching on the, the equity piece, um, you know, who has access to stormwater management or to get installations formed? Um, you know, are there different communities being left out of that, uh, out of the education piece and out of the monetary incentivization? Um, you know, programs like FYI through Urban Conservancy, you know, provides a grant um, 
I wonder what that would look like, you know, on a federal level or a city level, um, so that people do have access to that if maybe they can make below a certain amount or something like that. Um, and there are other organizations as well that I think touch on, like, not even touch it, but that's like what they talk about. Um, Water Collaborative, I feel like, is trying to address that equity issue in a lot of their discussions that they're having. Um, <laughs> going back to that other question, the 10 to 20 years, like even Water Co Collaborative, I saw go from being in a living room, people just discussing issues with water, mm -hmm. and now it's like this full-fledged organization. Um, the other component, I think, as far as citizens' uh, contribution is maintenance to these systems. If there's just public access to it, um, I think Friends of Lafitte on the Greenway is really gr great with um, volunteer opportunities like solar, um, where citizens can come out and learn about these systems and how to maintain them over time. Because um, that's, that's a really big piece as well, is that these systems get installed, but then nobody's upkeeping them. And not that, nobody, but. That Parks and Parkway, who do keep up with those, I, I know that there were some issues where they were mowing down some of these native grasses that were supposed to be filtering and detaining and retaining kind of um, things that, that Sam was talking about. And so if they're not educated as to what to do, then you've just spent all this money and time and effort, and then it's mowed over in, in five seconds. So it happens to us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, this is a start, and it, I guess it's kind of the reason that we went with the 10 or 20 years, because there could have been any time frame, you know, like what, how has it changed? But I, I sense it has really changed a lot in the last 10, 20 years because of, well, of course, Katrina is what made all of us kind of wake up and go, oh my gosh, we need to figure this out. And then the Dutch dialogues and the, the Wagoner and Balls idea of living with water and then all the new businesses, nonprofits, et cetera, that are doing all this work um, to help make a difference. I mean, it was the reason I wanted to move back to New Orleans because it's exciting. All the, the positive things that are happening, but there's so much more that needs to be done, right? I mean, I, that's a silly statement. There's so much more that we could do. Um, but the big thing is, I, 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 of course, you know, wanted to bring the feds and, and city in here. Well, city utility, because I, I, I hear people complaining and blaming, and, it, you know, you're doing your job that you are supposed to do. Well, um, you know, with some exceptions, but um, we'll leave that for the Q&A part. Um, no, but the, the point is, is that we all have a role that we can and should play. We love this city. We embrace this city for all that she has to offer us, and we have to figure out if we're going to live with water or if we're going to move. I mean, really, that's the decision now, and, and uh, I'm living with water. I don't know about y'all, but um, I'm going to figure it out and, and figure out how to retain it. So um, I just wanted to add that, that statement there and see if y'all have any, any comment about that. And um, all the people who are here learning from you, you know, tell us, what can we do? <coughs> Volunteer, where do we find that information? There's the Water Collaborative, but there's not one place to go to find out all this information. So what can we do? Give us some solutions. One place to go? One or two. <laughs> um, Ready Knoll is a pretty good place to start, right? No, no. Ready Nola? Do you all know Ready Nola? Is it Nola Ready? Nola yeah, Ready. Nola <laughs> 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 it's a good place to start. Ready, um, no. Sign up for their text messages. They have interesting text messages. <laughs> um, and they have a list of all the, like, they try to have a list of all the organizations and information around town. Sujan Warboard, too. I always go on y'all's website and like read about you. You put a lot of information up there, so it's another great place to start. <laughs> yeah, I would similarly suggest um, Nola Ready has a page called, or like a whole portal called Ready for Rain that I think is probably the best version of like a one place um, for stormwater management. I was gonna tell you to call Sam. <laughs> you can call me. <laughs> I will. I will chat for hours. <laughs> I think in terms of urban stormwater management, I think the the organizations represented here are always good places to start for information. 
Um, in terms of what you can do, I think I would be remiss as the federal representative here if I didn't say, call your congressperson. I mean, it sounds cliche, but that's basically my board of directors. And um, they, you know, they tell us what to do. And it can sound, sometimes it's daunting. I mean, there's a lot of people competing for their attention, but if, if nobody, if you don't do it, you know, who's gonna do it? So um, if, you, um, if you go in person, that's more effective than calling. And if you call, it's more effective than emailing. And if you ever find yourself in, in D.C. and want to go see the Smithsonian with the family or something, stop in their office if they're there. Um, you'd be surprised how often, if they're available, they'll be willing to, to meet with you. So um, I know it sounds like it's a long way removed from water management, but like I said, someone's got to do it. This is Dana Ines from the Urban Conservancy. <laughs> the candidates that are, are running now for um, city council, we are working with the Water Collaborative and the Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana um, to organize a candidate forum, runoff forum um, on November 30th. And so we'll be sh we can make sure that we get information out in all sorts of ways, but it's at the broad side um, in public. It will also be streamed, but it is, it, we're calling it the um, water runoff. So it's very focused on water issues, both coastal and, um, and uh, stormwater management and um, the third thing, I can't remember, but, but it is it's focused <laughs> on, the, um, on the issues relating to everything we're talking about tonight. So there's a, there's a local tie-in as well to, to that advocacy piece with the political side. I probably should have mentioned that. <laughs> That's a, using the word equity is a very powerful, when you're bringing people together, trying to unite the community, you've got to make it very clear from up front that we're, we're talking about everyone. And the more that word is used, I think the more powerful it is for people to understand that this is a movement to improve the community. So I congratulate you on using that language. So we're gonna have um, an opportunity for Q&A now. And um, Jimmy, raise your hand, Jimmy. He's gonna be on that side of the room. Um, he's gonna come to you if you would like to um, ask a question to the panelists. You can ask either you know, a blanket question or direct your question. And then over here, Abby's gonna be walking around as well. So all you have to do is raise your hand. Um, I'm gonna get it started by, there's a, a question that was sent in through YouTube where um, the question is, is permeable concrete appropriate for sidewalk usage in residential areas? Yeah. So the answer is yes. <laughs> you want to elaborate at all? Or do you, is there a place where, it, where we can see it anywhere in the city? That so if you go to um, the neighborhood around um, Parkway Bakery, um, the city installed permeable uh, concrete sidewalks throughout that entire neighborhood. Yeah, Dookie Chase. Dookie Chase has them at uh, oh, yeah. the restaurant also. So does the Greenway. Yeah, along the Greenway too. Concrete still have to be vacuumed regularly? Yes, ma'am. That's something that they recommend doing. I, I believe it's like once a year. I believe, I believe once a year they recommend cleaning the concrete. Did, did the installers provide that thing? Do the that, installers that, provide that service? That would depend on who your contractor is. Um, I don't have a back truck, so I wouldn't be able to do it. But there are people who, who uh, privately contract out to do that sort of work. Thank you. Who was that guy? Was it Hunter? Hunter? Just following up on that, I wondered if it cost more or less than regular concrete. It does. It does. Yeah. A lot more. 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 <laughs> it does cost more. I, I don't. I wouldn't. You could probably say better than I could with like percent more that it would cost. 
But it's like thirty percent more. Yeah. I believe it's like 30%. 30 percent. Thirty. Traditional concrete has also gone up too. Prices, yeah. material prices have been all over the place in construction. During the pandemic, so yeah. Hopefully, there's more, more incentive now. <laughs> uh, Tyler, I had a question for you. Did I understand you to say that uh, New Orleans has a code requiring commercial businesses to maintain the 1.25? inches of rainwater on their own property yeah it's for new development or redevelopment so there's you know for instance like costco when it was built was not that requirement didn't exist at that time so they are not currently required but if that site were to be redeveloped then it would be required do you see that being extended to um, private home ownership no i i think that um in, in some ways, um, there, are, there are plenty of ways that you can incentivize or, or in this case, not necessarily incentivize, but force um, new construction of, of homes to hold water. Um, 1.25 inches probably isn't the right number for a, for a single family homeowner lot, particularly in sort of the older portions of New Orleans where you have maybe like a 30 by 100 lot. It's really difficult to achieve that. So but um, maybe a subdivision. Maybe a new sub well, certainly in a new subdivision today, they would be required. Um, but unfortunately, very few new subdivisions are being built in New Orleans these days. Yeah, I live on the North Shore. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this is just in the city of New Orleans. being built and right. very serious flooding situations occurring because of that. Yeah. Getting back to permeable concrete, is there any financial assistance or tax credits available if you install that? No, not here. No. <laughs> Should be, Unfortunately. Though. Yeah, right. Um, this question's mostly for Mr. Ant Antrop. Is that okay? Um, what are your thoughts on, I get that you're probably biased in this, but what are your thoughts on privatized water? And do you think it's better to be privatized or public water source? For the general public, not for like, yeah, for the, for the general public. Um, well, I can only speak for myself uh, I, as a, you know, a civil servant of at this point over eight years. Um, I think that there's a lot of value to public institutions. Um, I think that it means that we're much more accountable to the communities that we serve. It also means that um, we don't drive a profit from the work that we do. And so every cent that we generate through our user fees and our and the rates that we charge our customers go back into um, investments in that system and the generation of the services that we provide. Um, when you privatize an entity, that means there's going to be some sort of profit that's derived from that service. Um, and I just don't think personally that uh, something that's as critical as water, um, that I think is a, a human right, should have a profit derived from it. So what do we know about what permeable pavement or pavers does for actual subsidence? Um, I'm very interested in understanding how it allows New Orleans to not sink any further than we've already sunk. And then also the difference between, you know, you, there's a lot of repaving going on right now in the city, which is a little frustrating because everyone complains about the lumps and bumps in our Way our roadways, but doesn't understand why, um, why it happens. And so, I was wondering if y'all could answer that. Anyone on the panel? Well, it's a, there's a couple different reasons that the roads are the way they are, and sometimes that can be from sewage leaks as well, um, which he could explain that better <laughs> than me. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so ultimately we have this dense clay soil that is the result of thousands and thousands of years, probably millions of years, of sedimentary deposit, and that's just how the, the, this muck soil that we have here, it's dense. You can almost make pottery out of it. Um, well, you can. They used to make bricks out of it. Um, but essentially, this soil, what happens when we pour impervious surfaces on top of it, it doesn't allow the water to hit the soil, and essentially, desertification happens underneath that soil. So think of it like a sponge where if it's wet, the sponge is soft and sort of like pliable, and then it dries out, it's like all crumbly and, and, and you know, it just crumbles apart. So that's what happens to the soil underneath 
traditional concrete. I was just wondering if there's any data that shows how permeable pavement actually affects this. Yeah. If it raises the water table enough that it re um, filtrates into the soil and holds it there and reduces sinking. I, I know that you were saying, like, how, what are the effects? We don't know what the effects are actually of all of this green infrastructure yet, but. I know the, I know the EPA has a lot of information. If you go to the, the, the government website, they have a lot of information on those, those numbers and those statistics. So, so we have done a lot of work um, working with, in particular, Dutch scientists on this, on this issue locally. Um, Unfortunately, there's not very much data to, sh to suggest that, you know, a localized installation of per pervious concrete or permeable pavers is going to have any kind of meaningful reduction in subsidence, even in that specific location. Um, really, the subsidence issue is kind of a much larger issue that has to do with our gray infrastructure drainage system um, in that, you know, the pipes that drain the stormwater from the city are You've seen these big concrete pipes, particularly around town, as they're replacing them. Um, they have like a male end and a female end, and they couple together, but there's a gap that remains between them. Um, that's not sealed, and so as subsidence continues to occur, um, those pipes start to break apart and the gap gets bigger. And so it actually acts as more of like a French drain within the soil and is constantly draining groundwater out of the system. So um, what we typically find around the city is that the sort of average daily groundwater <coughs> level is equal to the drainage pipes, um, the depth of, of the drainage pipes in that area. Um, and so really it's, it's less about, um, the green infrastructure solutions are really less about um, reducing subsidence <coughs> and about just finding ways that we can more actively manage our gray infrastructure system um, to help us reduce subsidence. Um, what we would really need to do to make a meaningful impact on subsidence find a way to essentially allow the pipes in the ground to be full of water um, during most of the time and then we would basically pump them down in advance of a rain event so that there would be space in them to hold the new water that's coming into the system um, so that way you could more actively manage the height of the groundwater in the ground if I could just make uh, one point on that too uh, sorry sir no go ahead. Um, it's also important to remember that the, that subsidence we're talking about here just under the concrete or at the level of a drain is is only the most surficial layer of of our geology here and so there's you know the the muck soil that clay soil that um we're talking about goes thousands of feet down and there are at least six or seven or, or more processes occurring at various levels in that depth some of which are regional and have been going on for thousands of years and so the subsidence you observe at the surface level when you compare it to sea level or to a geodetic datum or something is really the integral of all of those processes occurring at the same time. So we can, we can work on a few of those. We can, work, we can make our surfaces more permeable. We can manage our city's infrastructure differently. But there's really nothing we can do about the really deep stuff. I mean, you go down a few more levels, yeah, maybe uh, not pumping as much groundwater or not extracting as much oil and gas. But those things have kind of stopped anyway, at least locally, at least on shore. Um, but when you go deep enough, there's nothing really we can do. And so that's why preparedness is so important. You know, um, There's mitigation and there's, and there's adaptation. And no matter what you might want to do for mitigation, you must also do adaptation and vice versa. Um, they're really two sides of the same coin. Uh, I live on the North Shore also. and. Uh we have, especially in our uh, new subdivisions, they have these retention ponds and detention ponds. Uh, and the object is to uh, absorb the, the rainwater in the local area and hold it and then let it drain off uh, so that it just doesn't uh, flood the streets and so forth. And. Uh, in some cases, in these new subdivisions, we have lakes, uh, and I would imagine that is, St. Tammany requires that of, of these new buildings, uh, these new constructions. And I was just wondering if if that's at all possible here in New Orleans. I, I know New Orleans has been around for a long mm -hmm. time, and it's, uh, but I mean, is it possible to have these ponds and and detention? lakes uh, to 
absorb the water in, in our, these major rainfalls? We do have that in New Orleans East. I mean, the, there are large portions of New Orleans East that have very little flooding and have very little subsidence because they do have um, these large sort of man-made um, bodies of water that are also amenities in the community. Um, at the time, those were actually required by us when those subdivisions were built as a way to um, attenuate the flow of water from the subdivisions out and, and reduce flooding in the larger community. Um, I think that that does sort of open up a larger conversation, though, around the fact that we are really the only um, below sea level polder community in the world that doesn't have um, a lot of surface water. Um, we really keep our water underground, um, so that contributes to a lot of the groundwater issues and subsidence issues that we have. So, um, you know, certainly the idea that we could insert more surface water into the city would be beneficial um, from a number of different um, perspectives, but also creates a lot of challenges, both in terms of figuring out where to put it, um, how to keep the water in it, how to keep the water clean and safe so that you're not, you know, prevent, you're preventing vector breeding and, and things like that that we don't want to create um, by introducing more water into the city. But certainly something that needs to be considered. Um, I had a so, question. Was someone wanted to say something? Um, so uh, all oh. this this conversation in the last few minutes has to do with scale in part. And so I remember, I remember about two years ago, uh, Sewage and Water Board Director Corban was in Copenhagen looking at green and gray infrastructure in Copenhagen. And Tegan Wingland from WWNO was interviewing him, I was all excited. And she just pressed him hard on green infrastructure. And I think he was very honest in saying, our gray infrastructure, like, uh, we don't have the power resiliency for the stormwater and also for the water delivery system. So we got all these boil water events and so on. And he, he wasn't poo-pooing <laughs> green infrastructure. Like, he's totally understanding, totally committed. But at the same time, just saying, look, the scale is, this is the big deal. And it still is. It's remarkable in Hurricane Ida that actually our power held. We didn't have a big rain event, but uh, we didn't go for a month without clean water like Jefferson Parish. I mean, it, it was pretty remarkable. But anyway, I think I'm always concerned about scale of anything, you know? And that doesn't mean that working locally and at the smallest scale is meaningless. It's just really hard. It's a wicked problem. It's what we call a wicked problem in sustainability science. Anyone have any thoughts about trying to emerge above that besides the fact that we need a bigger tax base so that we can do these things? Yeah, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head that, um, you know, uh, my, my boss, yeah, uh, Executive Director Kaban, um, is very supportive of green infrastructure. He oversaw a massive green infrastructure program in Milwaukee where he came from before this. And, you know, when I worked at the city, I oversaw the city's green infrastructure program. And now that I'm with the Sewage and Water Board, you can probably tell tonight I'm not talking that much about green infrastructure. I'm talking a lot about our water systems more broadly. Um, because the challenge that we have is, as I said, we're running a, a huge deficit annually on just operating the pumps um, and maintaining the pumps. And so um, as much as green infrastructure is a fantastic solution and, it's, and it is the future and it is what we need to be doing, um, we can't ignore the fact that the gray infrastructure systems that we have are critical. Um, we cannot just, the, the green infrastructure is not a solution that can replace gray infrastructure. It can only augment it and take the load off of it. So we're never gonna create enough rain gardens and detention facilities around the city that we can remove the pumps. Um, in fact, with climate change, there may be the need to build even more pumps in addition to green infrastructure if we continue getting these storms. So we have nine inches of rain in an hour, two or three times a year. Um, and we just don't have the resources to make those improvements today. Um, and so, you know, as much as we love 
you know, seeding the, the industry with little bits of money that we can find here and there. We support the organizations and we can show up at events like this and say this is amazing. Um, when it comes to actually putting shovels in the ground, we just can't do it because we don't have the resources. Yeah, I think, I think scale is the key. I think you nailed it. Um, the, when, when the Corps of Engineers does a project, we always do it with a local sponsor. It's usually a state or a city or a, a port authority or something. And so we partner with these local um, <clears throat> entities to come up with a solution that's mutually agreeable for both the federal interest and the local interest. And we see a lot of our local partners now wanting green infrastructure. And they, they want, you know, if you're talking about a, a coastal storm risk management project, they don't want to have a levee or a wall. They want a, a forest or something. And um, so it's really hot right now. But what people don't seem to understand yet is the scale required. You know, there's this old uh, rule of thumb that's, that's not really true, but it still gets repeated that like every uh, three miles of marsh knocks down one foot of storm surge. You know, that can't be true because it's too simple, right? But um, even if we imagine it were true, that means that to get 20 feet of storm surge knocked down, you would need 60 miles of marsh, you know? You would have to fill Lake Pontchartrain with marsh um, to have that kind of an effect. And so think about the cost of building 60 miles of marsh, the environmental impact, because you're really replacing one ecosystem with another one. So now you have to deal with that impact. You know, so the, the, the scale is the key part. Um, you can't have a levee one foot high and expect it to work, and you can't have a buffer, you know, 10 inches wide and expect it to work either. So, um, like, like Tyler was just saying, you know, you have to build these things to work, and you have to understand the importance of scale and, and how they're going to work together to make it function. And, and so, you know, the feds and, and then sewage and water board talking about that, but so, you know, I agree. I mean, we can't just solve our issues with green infrastructure. It's got to be a combination, and that's why having your organizations, your business, um, do contributing to this and telling us how we can contribute on our own is so important. So, I mean, that that's I agreed. We need we need everyone to to play a role. Okay, my question was, I I know that putting in green infrastructure like permeable pavers and things like that is a bit more expensive than uh, like traditional gray infrastructure. I was curious if people are willing to, and businesses are willing to invest in this, will it last them any longer than gray infrastructure? Um. It, it depends on what you build. So like there are some like popular forms instead of per, uh, permeable concrete, having pavers that allow water to go inside. Uh, now you don't have to tear up the entire sidewalk to fix it if part of it breaks. You can just tear up that section. Um, so that can last longer. And I mean, most green infrastructure would be like a rain garden. So like a rain garden versus a regular garden, you know, it's gonna last a about the same, except I guess native plants will not need to be replaced as often. Uh, so it's a little bit less maintenance on that part. But I guess it depends on which green infrastructure you're talking about and where you're putting it. Uh, you keep talking about green infrastructure. Uh, tens of millions of dollars were allocated to that Mirabue project. And year after year, absolutely nothing happens. So is that money gone, or did it get siphoned off, or what happened to that whole project? I mean, I, I can tell you what I knew when I was working at the city, but I don't speak for the city anymore. Um, as far as I know, those funds are still obligated, but... Um, you know, it's it's had delays due to design issues and bidding, um, but that's that's really all I can say. Years I, have I gone just don't by. know. Oh, I, I'm just as frustrated as you are. <laughs> oh, 
of a cyber attack. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that wasn't a hundred million dollars that was allocated. That's just small. And the second thing is, yeah, well, that's not a hundred. That's nothing that's been done of that money. And the cyber attack, that's like saying the dog ate my homework. I mean, that's ridiculous. <laughs> Community Adaptation Program. Hello, um, I'm uh, with Recycling Farms Coalition. We're an urban farm and food justice nonprofit in Central City. Um, I'm also an AmeriCorps member, so it's nice seeing some alumni on the table right now. Um, my question is if any of y'all can touch on the role that urban agriculture can play in water management in the city, um, from small scale of backyard and community gardens to more larger operations like Veggie Out in the East and Grow That in a city park, and any challenges that urban farmers face with water management? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's funny that you asked that question. I feel like uh, a lot of our recent projects have been community gardens and placemaking, um, and also taking into account water retention. Um, so we try to install systems that involve that. Um, one system is called, it's called a Hugel culture. Um, and that's incorporating digging into the ground, doing several different layers, and, and it's kind of like a self-watering system where you're directing water, directing water into a garden, uh, but then building it up, building the garden itself up, and it takes many different forms. Um, one, one we did more traditional, if, if you look them up, I, I can't, it's a hard thing to describe, but it's a, a mounded raised garden, and then underneath it, it's dug out, and it, and it's meant for water storage and watering your plants. And uh, another system one that we're, so it's technically a hugel culture, but we're building these vertical gardens right now out in the lower ninth. Um, and it's all meant for, you know, for edible growing. Um, and we're, we're trying to figure out how we want to water these systems because we're building them upwards. Um, and, and how do you want that water to hold in, in it? And we're like pipes, you know, that go into it water in and then it's slowly discharging water in the gardening system. So many different forms. I mean, a lot of times in these gardens, we're trying to also attract pollinators. We're trying to attract bees and other birds. Um, so we'll be planting water, water gardens as well, um, rain gardens in tandem with edible systems. Do you think the cost of doing some of these green infrastructure projects will come down as the technology evolves and as the um, demand for it um, increases? Um, I guess I really just don't know, but I just read something on like futurology or something like that, and they're predict. I, I don't even. I'm going to butcher it, but they gave some stat about how sustainable products are predicted to drop in the next. 
and I, I don't know any specifics on that, but. <laughs> Definitely, like, as there's more demand, I guess, you can buy in mm -hmm. larger, like, there'll be a huge problem right now with a lot of these projects is getting supplies. So, you know, as there's more demand, there would probably be more supplies, maybe. <laughs> and then you could buy in bigger bulk. And I think that's where a lot of the price comes from. It's just the raw material. Hey y'all. Um, I remember in elementary school, I was at the water fountain and my friend came up to me and was like, you know you're drinking toilet water? And I was like, huh? Like, that's ridiculous. But the ridiculous idea is that we're not drinking toilet water, we're pumping uh, drinking water into the toilets, right? So ideally, you'd want to be using secondary wastewater, gray water, all that. Um, so I just wanted to know like what, like I, you know, what would be your dream goals in terms of like wastewater usage or what like what kind of fantasy do you do you see for for wastewater usage in the house or ways that we can be more water conscious even if it's radical there's definitely like these very large cisterns that some other cities use that cycle rainwater that is being captured into things like not uh not potable water but like into things like your toilet tank because like really that doesn't you're right that doesn't need to be drinkable um so it's i think it's illegal here actually i don't know it is, yeah it is it is currently illegal here so. um I, I guess in the state yeah in the state it's it's not you you can't use um gray water in buildings in louisiana um i i think though that the the question that i always ask about this is like in, a, in an area where we, our, our source of water is like one of the most plentiful rivers on earth, um, why would we not just use the water source that we have? Um, you know, we compared to our, you know, I, I talked to like my peers, I was talking to someone that works at a utility in Tempe where they said they get like a half an inch of rain a year. Um, so like there, absolutely, that makes 100% sense that, you know, we should be doing whatever we can to make sure that every drop of water is used the most efficient way possible. Um, here, because we have such a plentiful source and the treatment process is so efficient and the way that we distribute it is so efficient, creating a secondary system is actually less efficient um, because you'd have to be creating a, a new, either new pipes that are gonna send a different source of water around um, like they have in Santa Monica and, and places in California where they have gray water district systems um, or you're creating more individualized treatment programs at specific facilities, which is gonna be way more energy intensive than the present system that we operate. So we, we have, a, we have a, a, an abundance of water here and so it doesn't necessitate the use of gray water. I think in some cases, you know, as like a demonstration or, or ways to sort of, um, you know, use them in, in specific opportunities, it makes a lot of sense. But um, broadly here, there's really no reason for us to pursue it. I did my master's in Tucson. <coughs> And uh, in Tucson, they do have a secondary system mm. to pipe gray water, reclaimed water, uh, mostly for, for irrigating. Um, and it, it requires a big investment. You have to have a whole second set of pipes running all over town, um, not to mention all the pumps and all the infrastructure that has to be uh, put in to, to run that. So um, yeah, we're lucky that of all the troubles uh, we, we have to face, of all the challenges we have to face in New Orleans, we don't have water scarcity um, to deal with. Um, I would still say that it, it's, it's an idea that is at least worth thinking about only because of the water energy nexus. So purifying water does take energy. There's a nexus between water energy and, and climate change. Um, but when you think about the embodied carbon of the, the energy that goes into making your water drinkable, just to put it in your toilet, you have to compare it to what you would do instead. So what's the embodied carbon of all those extra pipes and all the extra pumping and all the extra uh, infrastructure you'd be thinking about installing. So um, I'm glad you're thinking about it. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't think it's a great fit for our particular city, but it's certainly something that a lot of people, a lot of places are thinking about. And I will say, I, I do think the idea of an individual system, like just your household, 
is cool. Once again, I don't know what the entire carbon impact of building a giant cistern on your roof and then using gravity to pump that through the gray water um, of your own personal household. I mean, you can always just get a rain barrel and fill up a bucket and fill up the back of your toilet if you want to do that. Um, <laughs> I, that's, I mean, you know, that's, that's what surf did for a few months because they didn't have any water. So, oh, still? So that's what people, I mean, you know, that's always a way to do it. And it would be interesting to see what the energy and impacts of that would be if a lot of people were doing that because it's definitely doable, um, just a little bit more effort. No pipes involved, though, <laughs> just buckets. All right, we have one more question from YouTube, so I'm going to read it to y'all. It's, is soil runoff depletion part of the scope of the water infrastructure being discussed here? Soil runoff depletion slash depletion. I, mean, I don't understand erosion. the question. <laughs> Yeah, I, maybe soil erosion. Well, I can't reword it because yeah. it's not my question. <laughs> yeah. It came from YouTube, but I'm guessing um, it, soil runoff. So um, instead of it being absorbed into our system, you know, how it, we get all the runoff, um, and I'm guessing it's because of our uh, clay, right? Because the clay doesn't uh, – I'm going to let the experts answer it. I mean, I, I think about, like, construction, um, you know, and what we're doing when we're actually constructing things. Uh, what are we doing as far, I mean, because a lot of runoff comes from construction sites. Yeah. We see that all over the city. Um, so what are we doing to mitigate the mm -hmm. runoff while we're, while we're installing these systems and making sure that we're putting wattles in front of our storm drains um, and that they're staying there? <laughs> um, and making sure that that sand and aggregate isn't also going down there. We're placing things smartly. And I can only talk from like a smaller scale, but while residential green infrastructure is not going to prevent flooding when the levees break, um, I do know soil erosion on your personal property can be very annoying. And so forms of that can help prevent that. You know, adding more plants with thicker roots are going to at least help prevent that surface soil runoff so you don't have to keep on buying bags of soil from God knows where to replenish your yard. If they're talking about grass, then that's a whole different scenario, right? They Is it illegal to put the grass in the drain and the leaves and everything? Mm -hmm. Yes. That's illegal to put. Okay. <laughs> I'm serious. Um, we're right at 8 o'clock. And um, you filled the time very well. You helped us uh, really understand and get a better grasp on things from my perspective. And um, I want to... Uh, put one more thing up here. Oh, right when my computer died. Um, I was going to show y'all. We have uh, this has been streamed on YouTube, and um, so I know the Master Naturalist asked us if we would put the link on how to watch this onto their website. But I can also post that in our social media avenues and share it with you all as well, so that you can watch it or share it with your friends and family, those kinds of things. Um, but I sincerely want to thank our panelists for giving up time on um, on your you know during your week and coming and sharing your expertise with us. Um, you all were invited because you made such, uh, you know, your organizations and what you do make such an impact on all of our lives and definitely with the research that we're doing recently. Um, so thank you so much. I wanna thank um, all of my students who um, were voluntold, I mean, they volunteered to help out tonight and, um, and ask the questions and, um, and help out with the Q&A. So thank y'all, y'all are the best, you know you are. Um, Guests for coming tonight. Um, I'm, thank you for your interest, and uh, we love to put on seminars and, and educational um, roundtables, pan panels like this. So um, stay in touch with us. Let us know what you're interested in learning about. And um, you know, Janelle and the Master Naturalist, um, definitely, it's great to partner with you. So thank you so much for always um, supporting us and coming here and and um, co-hosting and um, working in collaboration with us. I'm guessing the panelists are probably tired, ready for dinner, since we couldn't feed you. But um, maybe if you can catch them on the way out, if you have one or two more questions. Uh, the Master Naturalist, if you missed the intro, there's a table up there with, um, inf uh, with nature store information, nature shop, and what else? Name badges, if you are newly certified. And um, 
volunteer opportunities. And then we also have some shirts left over and some caps and water bottles up there from our project this summer. And we'd love for y'all to rep Loyal Academy for us. So grab one on your way out if you would like and be safe going home. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Thank you.